So one of Rock's most revered singers was on her way to a secretive honeymoon after getting married. And during the drive to the couple's destination, a song came on the radio that blew her mind. It made her pull over to the closest record store and buy this tape. The song was so compelling, she canceled her wedding night and her honeymoon, and instead, she wrote her biggest hit. She rushed down to the studio, and in the process, she called the enigmatic artist whose song inspired the one uh, that she was writing, you know, to get permission to write what was essentially her lyrics over his music. It just so happened, he wasn't home. Instead, she found out he was 20 minutes away came to the studio, and in a flash of magic, he played a perfect synth melody for this song. It became her biggest solo hit, and the legend who inspired it actually turned down the writing credit for it. Later, when the music video was shot, though, this female almost died when a horse almost toppled her. Man, story of a great song is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you've ever had a meal from the Easy Bake Oven, <laughs> you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below, click the red button, and click the notification bell so you always know when our latest and greatest are coming out. We have some great interviews coming out. I know you'll dig it. Also, check us out on Patreon and check out our merch below. Oh, this is quite a story. It always is when it comes to Stevie Nicks. On the day of her wedding, Stevie Nicks and her new husband were driving down the famous Ventura Freeway. They were headed to Santa Barbara for their honeymoon. Suddenly, a song on the radio caught her attention and immediately it ignited her an idea for a new track. She was completely captivated and she insisted that her husband pull over to the next record store so she could buy the tape of the song. It was a frenzied attempt to get her hands on Little Red Corvette by Prince. Now, instead of celebrating their wedding night, the couple stayed up all night long working on what would become Stand Back. Uh, Stevie Nicks later explained, and I quote, We got the song, and I was basically borrowing Prince's instrumental melody from Little Red Corvette. Now, although Stevie's lyrics are very different from Prince's suggestive classic, she felt like she was weaving in and out of his song uh, when she was crafting Stand Back. It was an original composition lyrically, but she really believed something was transferred to her spiritually. Stand back, stand back. In the of my... Then Stevie went to the studio and she recorded a proper version of the song. She called Prince and she was both excited and a little bit nervous to talk to him. After all, on one hand, she was going to admit that she was using his song to build her own song, but she was honest about it and how the song affected her. Stevie didn't want to do anything else with this song until she got Prince's approval. She said, and I quote, I know 50% of this song is yours, so what are you doing later? We're at Sunset Sound right now. Would you like to come down and hear it? Now, Stevie confessed that she never expected him to agree, not in a million years. But to her surprise, Prince wasn't at his home in Minneapolis when she called. He was in L.A., Stevie was blown away when Prince said, yeah, you know, I'll be right down. And within 20 minutes, he was at the studio. Prince listened to the track and went straight to a nearby keyboard and he started playing new parts, leaving Stevie in awe of what she was hearing. She said that was the coolest thing we'd ever heard. Stevie recounted this whole thing in Timothy White's book, Rock Lives. Great book if you haven't read it. She said he was so uncanny, so wild. He spoiled me for every band I've ever had because nobody can exactly recreate, not even with two piano players, what Prince did all by his little self. Now, ultimately, Stevie and Prince layered instruments over the song's melody for less than 30 minutes. Prince gave her a, I don't know you really that well kind of hug, and then like a phantom in the night, he just vanished. She, she didn't see him again for years, nor did they even have a conversation. <laughs> in the middle of my room, I did not hear from you. It's crazy. Perhaps through music, Stevie Nicks and Prince had a special connection. Now, they had spent some time together before that brief encounter in the recording session for Stand Back. Uh, and there was, uh, as I understand it, a mutual physical attraction, but they never acted upon it. Uh, Prince was inspired by Stevie's third single as a solo artist, Edge of 17, from the Belladonna LP. Uh, that's when Prince and Stevie became friends, and uh, I guess they exchanged numbers and they talked. 
Prince was particularly fascinated by the lyric of the chorus, just like the white winged dove sings a song sounds like you're singing. That line rang profoundly in Prince's head and it fueled the writing of his first number one single, One Dove's Cry, that's what he said. Now, Stevie recalled the night that they were together after a Fleetwood Mac concert. <laughs> she said, and I quote, we hopped into his purple Camaro and we blasted onto the freeway at 100 miles an hour. I was terrified, but I was also kind of thrilled. Uh, but she was quick to clarify that their high-speed rendezvous was purely platonic. She said, and I quote, I get on the plane and the rest of the band, Fleetwood Mac, is sitting there not saying a word, tapping their fingers and rolling their eyes, implying that uh, they thought something had happened between us. Stevie looked back at her disbelieving band members and said, what? Nothing happened. La, 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 la. Now, one thing that Stevie and Prince didn't gel on was drug use. He hated drugs, Prince did. He said, that's probably why we didn't hang out very much or more than that. She shared with the Associated Press, he was worried I'd die from an accidental overdose. And the sad irony is that he ended up dying from one. I imagine up there, he's looking down saying, sweetie, I can't believe it happened to me too. Stand Back was the lead single from Stevie's second solo album, The Wild Heart. It went to number five on the U.S. Billboard Top 100 in the summer of 1983, and it marked the beginning of a kindred musical relationship between Stevie and Prince. Now, Prince later reached out to Stevie to return the favor, in a way. His royal badness asked her to write the lyrics for Purple Rain. A lot of people don't know that. We're going to find out what happened after I mentioned today's sponsor, Campfire Audio. Now, the latest product that you're gonna be talking about, heck, everybody's talking about it, is the Campfire Audio Astrolith. Uh, in this episode, I'm wearing what I consider to be their greatest audio creation. It's another incredible product from Campfire Audio. As usual, Campfire's created a true work of art that does it justice to music that you love and appreciate. You're gonna hear it in a whole new way. Wow. When you listen to your music with Astrolith, You'll have an elevated experience hearing a fuller, more pronounced sound that accentuates every element of what went into the production of the music. The Astrolith has a dual planar magnetic driver configuration, utilizing two all-new planar drivers. The Astrolith is the vanguard of planar IEM performance. I love that the Astrolith is lightweight, even with its robust mirror-finished stainless steel faceplate. The Astrolith is as versatile as it is striking in appearance and performance. I'm telling you, click on the link below to learn more and to purchase the Campfire Audio Astrolith for a whole new listening experience. It's my favorite to date of Campfire Audio. All right, so Stevie Nicks and Purple Rain. So after she listened to a 10 minute music track of the song, she was paralyzed with fear and she turned him down on the spot. She admitted saying it was just too overwhelming. The unfinished draft left her terrified. She had no choice but to tell Prince that she couldn't do it. She said, I wish I could, but I can't. I'm sure Prince was disappointed, but things turned out pretty well for the Purple One. The song and the album of the same name were, of course, pop culture phenomenons. <laughs> There was a demo that was posted on Fleetwood Mac's YouTube channel on the day of Prince's death, though. It was reportedly recorded by the two beloved artists, but it was never released. The demo was titled All Over You. All over you. Now, as one can imagine, Stevie was heartbroken when she learned of Prince's untimely death. One of her great regrets was never performing the song with him on stage. Alas, Stand Back will always remind Stevie of that collaboration that could have been. All right, so let's go back to that honeymoon ride where Stevie had uh, that OCD moment hearing Little Red Corvette for the first time out of nowhere. You know, Stevie starts singing along to Prince's song, substituting the phrase, stand back. As she would say in an interview, and I quote, she was like, Kim, pull over. We need to buy a tape recorder because I need to record this. So we did. We went off the freeway. Uh, we found a record shop, and when they finally located that shop, Stevie bought a cassette single of Little Red Corvette along with a portable tape recorder. It was just one part of Stevie's uh, very brief 
but bizarre marriage to Kim Anderson. We talked about it in a piece uh, last year, but Stevie Nicks once shared with the LA Times uh, something that her father, Jess Nicks, said, not really a compliment, but she said, no man would be happy being Mr. Stevie Nicks for very long. That's what her dad said to her. Those words turned out to be uh, prophetic. Though it wasn't just her career that caused the unhappiness. In 1983, Stevie secretly married Kim, the widow of her best friend, Robin Snyder, who had recently passed away from leukemia. This was just after she gave birth to her son, Matthew. Stevie, who was named the baby's godmother, quickly realized that the marriage was a terrible, terrible mistake. I'm getting older too. Reflecting on her ill-advised decision, she admitted, we didn't get married because we were in love. We got married because we were grieving and it was the only way we could feel like we were doing something. Now, that wasn't really a marriage. We did it to take care of her son. Uh, but three weeks later, we realized it just wasn't going to work. And he says if anyone falls in love. Now, in a 2013 interview on Oprah's Masterclass, Stevie Nicks really opened up about the difficult time following her friend Robin's death. She explained how she became fixated on raising Robin's baby boy. She said, I just went on a mission because I wanted that baby, and I convinced Kim. Uh, so three months after Robin died, we got married, and I thought, that was what Robin would have wanted, but it completely backfired because it was the wrong thing to do. Taking Matthew and her husband was just beyond insane. Stevie eventually confessed to Kim Anderson that she didn't love him and she asked for a divorce. Some pretty heavy real life drama for sure, but there was a happy outcome. While she still considers the marriage a mistake, Stevie stepped in to cover Matthew's college expenses. She's also taken on the role of a pseudo-grandmother to Kim's daughter, whom uh, was named after Robin, uh, Stevie's late friend. Now she's affectionately known as Grandma Stevie. You can talk to me. Stevie's mood was angry, you know, combative, um, frustrated when she wrote Stand Back. There were a lot of different emotions that were shooting through her spirit at that time. Besides the artistic rush she felt, from Little Red Corvette, right? The theme of the song was a crazy argument between friends or between loved ones. Now her intensity really comes out in her vocal, the chorus, stand back. <laughs> we all stand back. The song is electrifying, subconsciously compelling us into a kind of a dance of defiance, if you will. In addition to Prince's uncredited 30 minutes of brilliance in the studio on February 8th, 1983, the recording of Stand Back was loaded with world-class musicianship. It's not going to surprise anybody here on the POR community that Stevie enlisted Steve Luke Lukather to play guitar on the track. Percussion was delivered by Bobby Hall and Ian Wallace. Russ Kunkel put together the drum overdubs, and Waddy Wachtel was also on guitar, and he still plays in Stevie's band, right, today. Performing background vocals on the track was uh, Stevie's sister-in-law, Lori Petty Nix. The only part that Prince actually contributed to was on the final recording where the eighth note upbeats in the chorus. The rest of the synth work, including all the main keyboard parts and the beat on the Oberheim DMX drum machine, those were handled by Dave Bluefield on the Oberheim OBXA. Although Prince was given co-writing credit due to the strong influence, you know, being Little Red Corvette, on the keyboard line at least, he didn't actually have any direct input in writing the song. In fact, as I understand it, for years he refused writing credit for the song. I mean, most of the time when you look up the song, he's not listed as a writer, only Stevie Nicks is. I've seen it sometimes where Prince is listed. I think Prince just wrote so many songs, he just didn't care. Having said that, you do have to give a lot of credit to uh, Dave Bluefield uh, for you know contributions on, on the keyboards. So following up the huge double platinum success of Belladonna, there were high expectations for Stand Back. Uh, the first big budget treatment of the all important music video that would most certainly be uh, embraced instantly by MTV was really elaborate but it seemed to be cursed. Uh, two incidents could have easily become tragedies. Let's talk about the first one. 
It's when the crew accidentally started the set on fire and they prevented the fire from spreading beyond control by just mere seconds. Second incident would have been even more disastrous though. Bear with me here. The video was supposed to have like this Gone with the Wind movie theme and Stevie was to wear this long dress you would have seen in that movie, you know, depicting the American Civil War era of the 1800s. On a scene where Stevie was riding a horse in this long gown, the horse went rogue and ran completely off course. It headed into a thick grove of trees, something a horse, you know, does when it's trying to throw the rider off its back. Again, just seconds before the horse reached the trees, the crew screamed at Stevie to jump, jump, and Stevie leaped off the horse, and uh, it was just in time to save her life. The gallop into the trees would have caused serious harm to Stevie, could have even killed her. So, I mean, this was back in the 80s when music videos, things were different back then. But not surprisingly, Stevie and her manager scrapped the original video concept that was directed by Brian Grant, who was renowned for his video work with Queen of all people. He later worked with Tina Turner and Rod Stewart and Peter Gabriel. By having a near-death experience and her life being saved, Stevie hated the original treatment for Stand Back. She didn't think it really fit the vibe of the song, and she told Brian Grant that she thought that she looked bloated. <laughs> she told Irving Azoff, who was manager at the time, this video, it cannot go out. I don't care if it costs a million dollars. So with no regard for wasted money, the Scarlet version, as it's called uh, now, was never released to the public and they hired a totally new director for a simple dance video. Stevie articulated that Stand Back has an energy that comes from somewhere unknown. And it seems to have no time space. She never quite understood the energy that it creates, but she has never questioned it. The freaky energy that the song brings has made a perfect way for her to start her live concerts. It magically sets the tone for the whole show and it really helps you know, Stevie to transform herself. Now, it's not widely known, but Stevie has always struggled with stage fright, going back to when she first joined Fleetwood Mac, something a live performer never wants to deal with, right? Stevie once said, and I quote, I become a different person, and I like that because usually I create my own characters. That's how she deals with the stage fright. Stevie's stage wardrobe didn't just make her stand out from her peers. It became a form of protective armor for her, as she would say. Uh, she shared in a 2009 interview with the New York Times, and nobody will know who I really am. The life of a rock star can go from magical moment to the twilight zone, really no time. The roller coaster ride of Stevie Nicks' life has certainly had thrills, chills, and spills, if you will. Just like the unexpected euphoria she felt when she first heard a Little Red Corvette by Prince in her car uh, that inspired Stand Back. And that breathtaking 30 minutes she had with the Purple One when she recorded the track in the studio. That story makes the song even more interesting, though. I tell you, I've seen Stevie several times in concert. Every time she performs Stand Back, you know, while she does that twirling dance that she does, I can swear I see the ghost of Prince playing a synthesizer right beside her. How about you? What are your memories of this classic song, Stand Back? I tell you what, Stevie Nicks has the craziest stories associated with her. Um, I, I just can't believe it. She forgot. She forgoes her honeymoon night to write the huge song that's been the starter of all of her concerts. She calls Prince. He happens to be here. It's just very magical. Let's have a great discussion about Stand Back. Do you think it's Stevie Nicks' best song? Is it one of the best songs of the 80s? What do you like better, Little Road Corvette or Stand Back? Should we cover Little Road Corvette? Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. Love to have you a part of our, our community here. Till next time, records and the truth, my friends.